Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I saw it all in slow motion. Funny how the mind works. I was flying backwards, falling. I saw a blurry figure, then the roof, then my feet and roof at the same time I hit, landing on my upper back first. Terrible pain. A crunch and blackness. What a damn nightmare. I groggily awoke. My head throbbed. My whole torso hurt. I had no idea where I was. I laid there for a few seconds before attempting to open my eyes. I squinted, seeing only a fluorescent light fixture. Ceiling tiles. I closed my eyes again. My body was a mass of pain, each breath agony. I felt like crying out but laid there trying to take stock of what was happening. The first attempt to turn my head told me that movement of any sort was not wise. An electric shock of pain shot down my spine. I tried to look sideways without moving. Even that minimal movement hurt. Then I heard the voices. Was that what woke me up? Is he going to live, doctor? Asked first voice. Yes. When do you think you will wake up? That is the question. He was showing signs of coming around earlier then passed out again. We just need to be patient, said voice two, who I assumed was the doctor. He's a lucky man if you consider what happened. The MRI showed no cranial bleeding, but there is already a little swelling. He is certainly concussed. We'll have to keep an eye on the possibility of his brain swelling further. His left arm is broken. At one spot, both the radius and ulna and at another, the humerus. From the way his back looks, he hit the stairs at shoulder blade level then slid the rest of the way. His back is badly bruised. His suit coat kept him from being scraped raw but still. Probably a good thing he was tilted towards his left or the gun he was carrying might have added to the damage. He might fracture his sacrum or his hip. He came to rest after hitting the back of his head. It is scraped and bled a lot. No stitches required. We cleaned the injury and bandaged it. I understand he stopped with his feet still up the stairs. He basically body surfed down until his head and shoulders hit the bottom. Voice one affirmed that. How he kept from tumbling, I have no idea. I'm guessing he went most of the way down in midair. It was about eight or ten steps, said voice one. I didn't count, but I will need it for my report. So no idea when we might talk with him? Pause. Okay, well, we have the woman getting checked out. She was pitching a fit about not wanting to be examined, but I saw some blood on her fingers and I wanted to collect any evidence before it got washed away. Oh, yeah, that brings up another point. The victim had three long gouges on his right forearm. Can you tell me which direction they were made? From hand towards the elbow or the other way around? I closed my eyes and tried to calm my breathing. The monitor was still beeping faster than normal but did not accelerate. I heard the curtain pulled back. I felt somebody fiddle with the tape on my arm. After a bit of poking. From hand towards the elbow, for sure, the doctor said. Which makes no sense if you consider the direction of his fall. Makes perfect sense if you think about it from a different perspective, said voice one. His right coat sleeve was pushed up and bunched at his elbow. But I'll need to confirm with forensics. Hey, do you think I can get a cup of coffee while we wait and I make a few phone calls? We have a pot at the nurse's station. Sue, can you get the officer some coffee? Ah, oh, better make it too. It seems his partner is here. I heard the curtain pulled back into its original position. So, what do you have? Asked the new person from the other side of the curtain. Voice. One told the other man what the doctor had said about me. Well, we got both a man and woman downtown. Said the second cop. Their stories coincide, but I don't believe it. It does not match what the witnesses say. How lucky is it we happened to be a couple blocks away about to eat when the call came in? The responding officers were barely there when we pulled up. I'm glad they could check the victim out and leave us to look at a fresh scene. Yeah. Voice one. Did you see the video? Video? The girl in the apartment across the landing was showing her folks her new apartment when all the shouting started. They opened the door with their cell phones out and recording to see a big naked man and a naked woman standing on the landing. The man yells, that'll show you your place you stupid cock. They couldn't see what the two were looking at down the stairs, but they got that part clear as day. I mean, it was graphic. The two had obviously just been having sex. Yeah, lucky the witnesses saw who was there, said second voice. One of them called 911. The young neighbor was squatting next to the victim when the first unit arrived. She pointed and said, he is the guy who pushed this one. Don't let him get away. The guy was dressed and coming downstairs. He was running. The woman was standing at the top of the stairs wearing a little robe and bawling. They both told bullshit stories with no mention of their being naked and having sex. According to them, they were innocently visiting, and the victim came in and attacked them, then ran out and fell over his own feet. Both men laughed. 
I laid there thinking about what I had just heard. As much as I heard, at least my brain was functioning. Maybe I could turn this around a bit. Would I be wrong to lie? To add a little to the story? Screw the a-hole. He pushed me down the stairs. I could have died. Hell, I could still be majorly messed up. Let me go back three weeks to where it began. Well, not when it began, but when I became aware something out of the ordinary was going on. My wife Judy was in the shower. She'd left her phone on her makeup table. It pinged and lit up. I looked at it. Hey, sweet cheeks, it began. Then the screen went dark. I tapped in her log and code and checked her recent messages. Hey, sweet cheeks. I want some of that hot sex. How about tomorrow afternoon? The message was from Judy's boss, Mark Danvers. Mark was the broker who owned the real estate franchise where my wife worked as a sale agent. This was not the first time my wife had received an inappropriate text from the a-hole. Just a month prior, Judy was sitting on the couch when her phone pinged and she opened the text. Unseen by her, I walked up behind to bring her a glass of wine. You looked fine this morning. I want some of that love as soon as we can get it on, it read. I about dropped the wine as I read that over her shoulder. I bristled. Judy neatly covered. She giggled. I bet he was texting his wife again. You know her name is Julie. Right next to mine in his contact list. He has messed up and sent me texts meant for her before. Her neck had turned bright red as she tapped a couple icons. Hey stupid. Robert just walked up as you sent me the text you meant for your wife. If you are going to flirt with her via text, make sure who you are sending it to, okay? No, you tell him. She put it on speaker. Hey dude, I'm so sorry. Mark said. I'm trying to spice things up with my wife a bit, you know? I sure did not mean to send that to Judy. Judy, thanks for not getting pissed I messed up. I was relieved. Judy giggled. No problem, Mark. Oh, I know I looked fine today too. But this woman is reserved for my man Robert. She hung up and we laughed about it. Both then and when we made love later that night. I'd all but forgotten the matter until now. If Mark had screwed up again, why was he texting his wife about tomorrow afternoon? Where was she tonight? I may be trusting, but I am not stupid. I realized my wife was cheating on me. I thought our relationship was solid. But apparently that was not the case. Judy and I met just a few months before we graduated college. Both business majors, we had seen each other over the years, sharing the occasional class but had not interacted socially. I was the typical nerd type, she the hot chick. We clicked once we actually got to know each other. I was not socially inept. Far from it. I'd had my share of girlfriends, but in my own social circle. I just was not the buff athletic dude you normally see with the hot chick. I stood all of five foot eight and might weigh 145 if I had rocks in my pockets. Not bad looking according to my sister and her friends, but just not a stud. Of course, my sister and her friends did not get to look inside my pants. I used that line once when my sister Becky told me I was not a stud in front of a couple of her friends. She was embarrassed as they laughed. I told them I packed every bit as much in my pants as those big boys they were so fond of admiring. They laughed, as did I, but I knew that what I had compared favorably from observations in gym locker rooms. My claims were validated one day when I overheard Judy tell Becky, you and your friends tease your brother and he teases back. But let me tell you, he packs every bit as much as anybody I've ever seen. Becky and her friend sputtered in embarrassment. It was a not a large meat my wife was seeking. Money? We got by but were not rich. She made enough sales to pay her business expenses and have a little spending money but she could not have supported herself on her commissions. I supported us with my sales rep job. After graduation, I had decided to continue my education and add accounting to the mix. My goal was to get my CPA and MBA and set up my own office. Working full-time, that was a slow process. To get there, I worked my butt off. My company sent me out of town to service a few distant accounts each week. I would see one client in Natchitoches in the afternoon, drive to Shreveport that night, and spend the night. See the client there the next morning and drive home. I'd have the whole weekend to spend with my wife. Now that I was aware of a possible fox in the hen house, I began to pay attention. Mark and his wife were over a decade older. Both about 40, they had twin boys finishing high school and a third a freshman at the local university. Judy and I had barely even begun talking about raising little ones. I admittedly wanted some. After five years together, for of them married, I was ready. We had been talking recently about her going off the pill and us working on getting her pregnant. She might have already stopped taking them. Now suddenly, I was glad we had waited. I realized I'd never have a child with Judy. I had looked forward to hot sex tonight. That was why she was in the shower, getting freshened. 
She knew I'd start with Oral. Well, her shower was wasted. I would not touch her at all. Not anymore. I'm not one of those guys who go for one final sex with a cheating witch. I went to our spare room where we kept the computer and began to surf for information. When she came in to find me a few minutes later, she looked and smelled good. She had spritzed a little scent. The translucent little top did not hide a thing. She was hot. I got hard and my little head asked me to go get busy. I almost changed my mind about screwing her one last time. Then I remembered the text. Sorry, babe. Not in the mood. Part of me wants you, but I'm feeling a little funny. My gut is acting up. I lied. She looked at me wide-eyed and before she could say anything, I stood and rushed past her to the bathroom making out like I had no time to wait. She called in to tell me she was going to bed and ask if I needed anything. I called out to tell her I needed time and would come to bed when I felt better. I had read accounts of how people put spy apps on their partner's cell phone to monitor their activity. I thought it was bullshit. I mean, I know it is possible to commandeer a computer remotely, but you need to be a hacker or no one. Or so I thought. It turned out to be far easier than I imagined. Many people would not think it proper to spy on a spouse, but it is totally legitimate to monitor a child. That is how the apps are advertised. Protect your kid from a possible sexual predator. Monitor their cell phone activity. Know their location. Who knew it would be so easy? I hated liars. But I was going to be telling quite a few lies over the next few weeks. Some deliberate falsehoods. Some lies by omission. But cheating is a major lie so screw the witch. I decided I had more than a short-term bug. I used my fake abdominal distress as reason to get out of bed several times the next night and spend time in the bathroom down the hall. On one of those forays, I took Judy's cell phone with me to dot install the spy app and download her text files. I was new to this sneaky peep business. But Judy is a fairly light sleeper so I wanted her to ignore my being out of bed repeatedly and for periods of time. As I monitored her cell, I found that while Mark was a prolific salesman himself, he was even more of a horn dog. Real estate agents are in and out of the office frequently so they could get away together without any of their co-workers noticing. And they did at least a couple times a week. They flirted by phone often or the occasional text. I assumed the multiple calls were more flirting than business. I had been lucky to catch the text I did. Phone conversations were far more graphic. I kept multiple copies of one such conversation because it went into detail and provided a lot of information about their relationship. I did not need it to divorce Judy, which I fully intended to do soon, but I wanted undeniable proof she was a cheating witch. Let's have sex at your apartment this Thursday when the cuck is out of town. Mark asked. I love to bend you over the back of your couch and pound you from behind. Look, quit calling Robert a cuck. I've told you. It's disrespectful. Judy said. Mark laughed and started to say something. And I've told you before Robert's is every bit as large as you, if not just a tad larger. You were just too rough. I love that pounding which is why I keep coming back to you. Robert likes to make love more. But sometimes I just want it rough. Yeah, you scream when I pound away. Mark chortled. Should Julie use to love it too. But she says I get too wild and she likes it better if she can get on top so she can control the action. I guess your boy just can't man up and take you like you want it. Well, your jackhammer energizer bunny act is what I want every now and then. Like a couple times a week. But making love is great. I should have no complaints. Robert gets with it on occasion, but when I start to hurt, he stops. You don't. You just keep pounding me until you're done. My guts are sore, but I love it. I am madly in love with Robert, but sometimes I just want to have these wild sessions. Robert just has a nice balance of tickle and pain, and does not try to mark me. Judy said, and if you call him a cuck one more time, you won't get any this week. At least not from me. You'll have to get on your knees and beg your wife if you want to pound away. You are going to have to wear a condom and I am worried about that in case it breaks. Robert and I are going to have a baby. I hate condoms. Mark groused. Well, it's that or no sex. Judy said. And in case the condom breaks I'm going to have some spermicidal douches handy. Afraid my swimmers are better than the sea. Of Robert's? Mark laughed. Nice save there. Judy laughed. No, but I can't take the risk. Mark laughed. Said, all babies look alike. I've had three, and they were all ugly at first. And he'd be stuck if his name is on the birth certificate. That'd be funny to have him raise my kid. No, they don't. Babies are cute. And you need to remember. He'd have a year to contest it. Judy said, seriously. And you can bet if he divorced me because you were the father, I'd come after you for child support. You want to take the risk? Screw that. Maybe I ought to get snipped. Mark said. Julie certainly does not want more. 
and I don't want to give up that hot sex. You are a wild one. Well, snipped or not, Mark can have the 304. That conversation might not be admissible in court because at least one party has to be aware they are being recorded. It might even get me in trouble because of some civil rights violation bullshit. But I did not care. I wanted absolute proof Judy was cheating. I knew she would try to make me out the bad guy with friends and family. She claimed the affair was all my imagination or she only did it once or twice. How I was being unreasonable and not willing to forgive her a little indiscretion. Little indiscretion, bullshit. These three weeks while I got my duckies in a row was really dampening my former love for my wife. Once I knew for sure, I started the process to get rid of her. The first thing I did was to pay off all our debts. I had some significant college loans. Judy's were relatively small, but I paid mine off first. We were always careful with credit card debt. Our cars were paid off. We had even started to set aside a little money for a house since a mortgage was not that much more than what we paid for our apartment rent. I also began to stash a little cash. I knew I could not hide too much as we did not have that much, but it made me feel better to get something over on the witch. My research told me I'd be paying alimony for a few years since she did not make enough selling houses. I hope to minimize that a bit. I wondered if I paid my lawyer up front for his whole expected fee that would work to decrease our cash. I trimmed our cash reserve as much as I could. I started to have my paycheck diverted, but I knew I would still have to give Judy her half. I just did not want her taking more. I had seen and retained an attorney who was working on the papers. Once I had her served, the shit would hit the fan. Now back to that fateful day at the start of my story. I was supposed to be out of town. I had a co-worker take care of those accounts the previous week as well, so I could attend to my private issues. In my spare time, I worked through possible scenarios. At first, I thought I wanted to be surprised and shocked to find them in bed when I came home unannounced. I envisioned running a naked mark off at gunpoint. Maybe even not letting him stop to pick up his clothes. I'd throw his car keys to him once he was outside in the parking lot. Or just shoot his balls off. Then I fantasized about taking a tire iron to him, busting him across the head or backbone while he was pounding away. Break some ribs or bruise a kidney. Any of that would mean jail time for sure. I could not explain the tire iron as anything other than a premeditated attack. All my friends were aware I had a concealed carry permit and frequently had a pistol on me. Always when I traveled. There was no way I would square off and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mark in a fight. I was 5'8 and now weighed a whole 150, having gained a few pounds since college. Mark stood at least 6'2 or 3 and weighed 230. I know because he would brag how he still weighed the same as he did when he played college ball. That crap about standing up and fighting like a man is just that. Crap. David was smart enough to not face Goliath on the battlefield armed the way everybody at the time considered fair combat. He got out his handy-dandy slingshot and nailed the bastard. Of course, nothing in the Bible calls that unethical or cheating. It was written how God guided David to win. I just wish I had been as smart as David. All my plans and daydreams went out the window when I unlocked my apartment door. I knew they were in there. I saw Mark's car parked out front next to Judy's. Later, I would claim I did not recognize it. I was quiet when I opened the door, not jangling my keys as I returned them to my pocket. It would not have mattered. Neither of the cheating a-holes would hear a sound over their grunting and wailing. Do me. Do me. Pound me. Judy's words hit me like a sledgehammer. All my plans were forgotten. She was bent over the back of the couch like they had described in the phone call I had recorded. He was standing behind jackhammering into her. I considered booting him in the balls from behind, but his legs were close together. Mark was just about to climax when I hit him in the side, knocking him off the witch. You scum sucker. He screamed as he realized what had happened. I had not knocked him that far or that hard, just out of Judy. He was fast for a big man and grabbed me by the front of my suit coat. I tried to punch him to get away and get my pistol out, but a suit coat is pretty restrictive for fast, rapid movement like that. Not like in the movies. Plus, once he grabbed me, I was going nowhere. He shook me like a pit bull with a possum. His arms were so much longer that my swings hit empty air. I started kicking and I know at least one kick caught him in the balls. Not hard enough to make him turn loose though. He held on. By this time Judy had turned around. She could tell I was reaching for my pistol and she grabbed my right arm to stop me. I realized later that was why my right coat sleeve had been bunched up to my elbow and her fingernails gouged the three furrows up my forearm. I was trying to shake her off. I had not shut the door when I came in. Mark half lifted me off my feet and charged me across the living room and out the door. He turned loose when he shoved me out into midair over the stairs. 
I listened to the cops talking about what they knew. I quickly formulated a plan. I hoped it worked out better than my plan to run a naked mark off at gunpoint. I moaned loudly to let the hospital staff I had regained consciousness. The doctor came in immediately to check me out. He had me wiggle fingers and toes and concluded I was basically intact, but told me to limit moving. No shit, Sherlock. Blinking hurt. The cops came in and asked if I was willing to tell them what happened. I told them almost the same story I related above. I knew my wife and her boss had an ongoing affair and was taking steps to divorce her. I did not expect to catch them in my apartment in the act though. I told them the part how I was dumb enough to knock Mark off my wife. The part one added was what Mark said after he grabbed me. He said, you scum sucker, I am going to kill you. If you happen to live, you'll know your place, you stupid cock. I said, Judy grabbed my arm so I could not hit him or reach for my pistol. She said, careful, you know he has a gun. Should I can't hold him much longer. You're gonna have to do something quick. Next thing I knew all three of us are rushing across the living room and out the door. I'm not sure when Judy turned loose, but I was so far off balance, no way could I get my pistol. Then I was sailing out into the air backwards and then he to crunch. I guess he threw me down the stairs. I said, that is all I remember. I hope the doc is right and I'm not paralyzed. I said, did I feel bad about lying? About adding the part where he said he was going to kill me or Judy telling him to do it quick? Nope. Screw both of them. I just hoped there was no evidence to the contrary. Thinking about it, I wondered if they ever videoed themselves having sex. That would be bad. Forensics actually supported my story. Mark claimed I attacked him, and he defended himself. He was visiting Judy, one of his agents, because she was feeling bad and he was concerned. I must have got the wrong idea about what was happening. Then after he pushed me away and yelled at me, I turned tail and ran out the door. I tripped at the top of the stairs, hit the railing, and fell down the stairs. Judy agreed. Just adding Mark pushed me hard to get me going. She grabbed my arm to keep me from punching Mark at the beginning. And that was how I got scratched. The investigators found my suit pants were spattered with Mark's semen which proved I was very close to him and there were several smears of semen and vaginal fluids on my right pants legs which showed I had kicked him in the groin. I was facing him at the time, not running. They did not initially charge Mark with attempted murder but did with assault. Mark posted bail. He did not have the full amount of course so he used a bail bondsman. The 10% charge would still cost him 5000 out of pocket. I wondered if he felt the piece of bum he got worth it. I would not know about any of this for a while. Even my brothers conspired to not tell me everything they had heard until the doctors said I was out of the woods. They wanted me to remain calm. Shortly after I made my statement to the cops, I had an episode and passed out. To me, I had just closed my eyes and no time had passed at all. I awoke in a semi-dark room. I laid there for a bit thinking about the conversation I was having with the cops. I had already decided how I was going to respond to my cheating wife and Mark if and when I saw them again. They were not only cheaters, but now they wanted me dead. I would treat them accordingly. Just before I passed out I had planned to shoot Mark if he ever approached me. I'd claim I thought he was coming back to finish the job. Okay, so I like to fantasize about shit that is never gonna happen. A nurse was in the room. I did not notice the other person until she stepped close. It was Judy. I began yelling. Get her out. She tried to kill me. Get her out. One of my brothers rushed in to find out what was going on. Judy was shocked and began crying. No. 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 She wailed. I did not hurt you. I love you. You helped the a-hole throw me down the stairs. I yelled. They ushered Judy out. She was bawling and protesting the whole way. Okay, so I was being a prick. I did sort of want to talk to her. I wanted to hear her explain how she wanted rough pounding sex so bad. She would go look for it somewhere instead of talking to me. If she wanted rough role play on occasion, I would have been happy to oblige. But I would never condone her cheating. The doctors kept me in the hospital under close observation for a whole week because of my concussion. They were afraid I'd be out somewhere and my brain would start swelling. My two brothers visited regularly and even camped out in my room the first couple days. They could barely believe what I said about Judy. Finally, I whispered to John that I exaggerated her role helping the a-hole try to kill me. I can always back off that a bit later. I said, but for right now, I want the witch to suffer. She cheated. She destroyed our marriage and my trust. Tell Dave what I said. I'm paranoid about recordings, so we'll not say anything out loud here. John thought that part funny. The day I got out of the hospital, I told him the details of how I bugged Judy's phone. If you want, you can tell her I am hurt and angry, but I will talk to her when I am strong enough. Yeah, 
Give the witch a little hope, I thought. Like she gave me a little hope of a happy future before she trounced it. I was angry, but I loved the witch, which made the whole thing hurt even more. One of the visitors I allowed was Julie, Mark's wife. She came to see me as soon as she heard I woke up, which was a day after the event. Of course, she heard parts of what had happened. When charges are filed, the testimony and evidence is not publicized. She wanted to know why Mark had been arrested for my assault. As you can imagine, Mark had not been too open about the situation. He had given her the same line he had given the police. How he had been visiting one of his agents when her husband came home. Judy was wearing a robe and I jumped to conclusions and thought the worst. We got into a scuffle and I had fallen down the stairs. He was accused of pushing me but was innocent. I thought his story ludicrous. Obviously, he knew nothing about the video taken or suspected there might be forensic evidence. I wondered if the man was delusional or just hopeful the neighbors would not be questioned. I told her they were having sex when I walked in the door. Mark said you would claim he was having an affair with your wife. But it was all innocent, she said. I'm not buying that bullshit. What I want to know is do you have proof? I have a prenup. I get 70% of the communal assets if you cheated and I can prove it. Leave some for me. I plan to sue him for whatever he is left after his criminal trial. I said, you need to contact an attorney and file for divorce to lock your share of your assets so he cannot use that for his defense. I have an audio recording of them talking about their affair, plus copies of a few texts. But there is also a video of both Mark and my wife standing on the landing of my apartment just after he threw me down the stairs. Both of them are naked. On top of that is my testimony. But if that is not enough, the clothes I was wearing at the time might have some evidence on them. Hard to imagine I could get into a scuffle with a naked man who had just ejaculated all over and not have something on me. You have all that? She asked, shocked. I nodded. I told her I knew Mark liked rough pounding sex. That convinced her immediately I had everything I said. I'm going to see my lawyer as soon as I leave here. Please help me get the rest of that evidence as soon as you can. I assured her I would. Julie, I don't think either Mark or Judy realize just how much evidence there is against them. They told a lie and are sticking to it. They told the cops I misjudged the situation and overreacted and that is what got me hurt. I'll be willing to bet Mark is out there right now doing as much damage control as he can. He might be hiding money, but from what I understand you can get that back. Hopefully, you can fix it so whatever he forfeits to the bail bondsman is taken out of his share and not yours. She gave me a hug and wished me well before she left. I had met her before when Mark had parties for his agents like at Christmas and other holidays. She was nice. She did not deserve the shitstorm coming her way. I didn't either. The day after I got out of the hospital, I was sitting at my family's fishing camp. I planned to take as much medical leave as I could. Then I would burn my vacation time. My boss knew the situation and told me he was working on a way I could work remotely a couple hours a day as I recuperated and still draw my regular pay. I thought about how I lied and compounded their offense of cheating into a crime. Then I reconsidered. I did take a backwards tumble down a stairway. It was not due to my own clumsiness. I was pushed forcefully. Maybe Mark only wanted me out of the way so he could get his pants on without getting shot, but I really did not care. I was going for the jugular or his balls. That morning I was very busy. I canceled our credit card. I left Judy her half of the balance which was not much since I had paid our debts. I had not wanted to tip my hand too early, so I waited. Now it was time to finish it. I might have to pay it later, but for now, I could make things as uncomfortable for Judy as I could. The rent and utilities were all paid up, but I was not going to provide a penny for Judy to eat or for a drop of gas for her car. Not until ordered to do so by the court. Julie, Mark's wife, had moved swiftly. Despite my thought he might try to hide money, he apparently thought his line of bullshit was enough and he had nothing to fear. I was a jealous husband who let his imagination run away with him. She took her 70% of the available cash and had their investment accounts locked. But I wanted answers. I called Judy and told her where I was. She had called my brother several times while I was in the hospital begging for me to meet with her. I told her she could drive out that afternoon. I warned her she better come alone. If she brought Mark so he could try to convince me to drop the charges or some such nonsense, I would drop him where he stood but with a bullet. If I saw him, I would assume he was coming after me. I said this almost hoping they were recording what I said. I wanted it on record I was not going to risk another attack. It was a tearful meeting. I will admit, I hated losing the woman. I loved her, but not as much as before. I was sure she loved me but not enough to not cheat. Crossing the gap between fidelity and being loyal? She missed that boat. 
I am so glad you let me come out so we can talk, she said as she parked. You know I was not helping Mark try to kill you. She began. I shrugged. I invited her inside. I claimed I was feeling weak and needed to sit and asked her to get us drinks. Of course she knew the house well having been there many times. As I listened to her get the beers out of the fridge, I went to the living room, a small area that served as the communal gathering area that adjoined the kitchen and served as dual purpose. I tapped the icons on my laptop and cell phone to begin the video recordings. Both were focused on the chair where I intended her to sit. I sat down and waited. I'm wondering if you were trying to get me to say something on a recording. I began. She assured me she had not. My cell phone is in my purse. And to prove I have nothing on me. Without another word, she stripped naked to my total astonishment. Want to stick a finger up me to do a cavity search, to show I don't have bug hidden up there? She asked moving her hips. She was smiling now. This was a kinky game in her mind and she was all for it. I would have been too if she had not been screwing her boss. I told her she might want to get dressed while we talked. Screw that. She declared. I'll stay naked. You might need to give me a towel so I don't leave a snail trail on the chair. Are you sure you don't want to feel me up in case I have a recorder hidden up there? She asked, grinning. Please do it. Use a couple fingers and take your time feeling around. She was not being sarcastic. I could tell. She honestly wanted to play. The woman was hot. She was fully aware of the effect she had on me. I knew she was playing me. She had an agenda. Where do you want to start? She asked. Let's start with why. No, not why you decided to cheat. I want to know why you were willing to help that son of a witch kill me. I spat. I sucked in my breath trying to control myself. I wasn't trying to help him. Judy said tearfully. I was trying to help myself. I had no idea he was going to do that. I wanted to stop you from shooting him. Even when he pushed you outside, I thought he was going to close the door and we'd get dressed. Then we could deal with the problem. But then, he threw me down the stairs. I finished for her. She nodded. And you went inside and concocted a story to cover for him. You lied to protect the man who tried to kill me. She looked at me. Her facial expression a combination of horror and guilt. She nodded again. Yes, I thought. I was afraid you were dead. She said. He pushed you so hard you just flew out into the air. I looked down and you were not moving. Your eyes were not even closed. I was terrified. You did not even check on me. The police told me when they arrived Cheryl from next door was kneeling next to me but you were up on the landing in a robe, just crying, I said. You went inside, the a-hole got dressed, and you put on a robe. I guess you made up a quick story about how I came home to find you in a robe with your boss. He had just come over to check on you because you called in sick. I got the wrong impression and attacked him. He defended himself, and when he came at me, I ran like a chicken, tripped, and fell down the stairs. All an accident. I scowled. No mention of how I found you guys having sex. I did not describe it that way. Judy said. Then she paused. How do you know that? What we said. Because the cops interrogated me. I said. Two people told one story. I told another. I had a head injury so they wanted to make sure I could not have misinterpreted things. I noticed they just charged Mark with assault not attempted murder. Yet. I thought. Tell me why you lied your bum off for the son of a witch. Helping get him get off. I was scared. Judy declared. I'm sorry. I did not know if you were even alive. Mark told me that if you had a head injury and were still alive, you might not even remember how you got hurt. We heard the sirens and I did not have time to go get dressed. I just had my little rope. We made up a quick story and went out. Mark thought he might get away. If he did, I was going to say it was you and I having an argument and you tripped. There were so many holes in her story. I did not even mention Cheryl from next door and her parents were at least witnesses to her and Mark standing nude on the landing if not the actual assault. You were willing to go that far to cover for his butt? I asked, aghast. She nodded. He said he'd make it up to me. But if the truth came out he would lose everything and we'd both go to jail. Him for throwing you down the stairs and me for helping cover. Judy sobbed. If you were alive, it would be your word against ours we were. A doing anything. So we had to keep up the lie even after we found out you'd be okay. Mark kept saying maybe you'd have amnesia. You remember everything, don't you? Every detail. I said. You were talking about him losing most of his money because of the prenup with his wife, aren't you? You know I already told her what I saw. She needs proof to invoke the prenup. Your word is not enough. Judy said. Mark asked me to tell you he will pay you off if you change your story about him pushing you down the stairs deliberately. And about us having sex. He will give us $50,000. $25,000 each. We can use it for counseling. 
I'll quit my job and we can get back together. I had not expected this. I know I must have had an incredulous look on my face. Bullshit. I spat. Do you really think I would ever cover for him? Plus, there is no way he can get that kind of money without his wife finding it. You gotta know she is checking their financials. He won't be able to buy a candy bar without her knowing. He already has it in a secret account. Judy said. He has been hiding money in an offshore account for years. Royal Bank and Grand Cayman. He has been putting money in an account there using his oldest boy's name and social security number. He called it his retirement fund. He says he will give us some. All you have to do is change your story. Please, Robert, we can get back to where we were and have a nice little nest egg. Mark means nothing to me. He was just a good time. You are what I want. I want a family with you. She pleaded. I started chuckling. Do you not see all the holes in your bullshit story? I said, shaking my head. First of all, I'd have to lie about what happened. Judy told me I could say I was confused and maybe Mark was just coming at me and I panicked. Do you really think he would pay either of us a nickel once I change my story? I asked. He'd laugh his but off at how he got over on me again. First he made me a cuck and now I would be a dumb cuck who changed my story. He knows I'd never be believed if I changed my story back later. Plus why in hell would he ever confess to you he has been hiding money for years? He is not that dumb. I said. He knows you are gullible and hopes I am too. If it were true, he'd keep it a total secret and not even tell his own mother. Judy looked at me like the lights were coming on. Then she shook her head. I'm sure we can trust him. I told her before I even considered something like that. I'd have to see the bank transfer including the right routing and account numbers and bank name, proving the account exists. And then I might consider letting him go for a hundred thousand. Okay, now for part two. I said, why did you let that guy in your pants in the first place? What did I do to deserve that? Not man enough for you anymore. She teared slightly. How long have you known? When did you find out? I shook my head silently. You did nothing wrong. We had a great marriage. An active sex life. You and I had sex three times a week at least until you got sick with that stomach bug and then cut me off. Oh shit. I am so stupid. That is when you found out. She looked at me tearfully and continued. All this time she had made no attempt to sit, ladylike, but not spreading her legs. She sat casually her crotch open for display. Now she got embarrassed and reached down to put on her panties and shirt. Okay. I said breaking the silence. When did it begin? About three months ago. We did not have sex at the beginning. I mean not even once a week. I'm not even sure why I thought to start. I mean we had no problems. Sure. Mark flirted. He flirts with everybody. Hell, he'd flirt with you. Only he would call it getting friendly and establishing a rapport. I really can't say when that turned sexual. Well, that is not right. A lot of what Mark said had a sexual context. I think it was one day when he said he was unhappy with his sex life at home. He hinted he wanted to talk to somebody and like a fool I listened. I know now where it lead. It was a trap. I'm not sure Mark intended it as a trap or not. Thinking about it now. I wonder if he did it with other girls before me. But at the time I found it arousing just to hear him talk. He told me his wife preferred to make love, not get down and dirty like they had years ago. He missed the wild pounding, animalistic sex they had when they first got together. I could not help it. I was aroused as hell. That night I jumped your bones. I did not even need any warming up. I climbed on top of you and rode you to a couple orgasms. You were happy to help me. You did not even ask what got into me. Well, you did but I did not tell you the whole truth. I just told you I wanted you to screw me and make me yours and you did. I have thought about that night a lot since. Just the memory of that night has me on the verge of climax. Judy paused to see if I take the bait. As much as I really wanted to, I sat in my chair clenching. She took a few deep breaths and continued. I wanted that high again. Not a drug high. A sexual high, Judy said. That was over a weekend and we screwed like rabbits the whole time. I remember it. So, did I. It was a great weekend. My wife was all over me. We did nothing but have sex and then rest and eat a little so we could screw more. The next week Mark and I talked. I did not tell him about us screwing our lights out. Not at first. He told me he got one good hard sex in and Julie wanted the rest to be sensual lovemaking. I was aroused enough I did what I swore I would never do. I talked about us having sex. I told him we had a wonderful time the whole weekend. That week you and I had sex probably every night. It was all good but none of it was the mind-blowing sex we had the previous weekend. Mark said he could give me that any time. Judy said. I laughed but after a few days I started to wonder if he could. I wanted that hard pounding sex so bad. 
Judy admitted. The more I thought about it, the more I craved it. You did me hard during that weekend we had. Mark and I had shared stories up to that point, but had not touched. Finally, one day after Mark all but begged me, I offered to let him try to get me off. That was my downfall. Judy offered quietly. Mark does not make love. He screws like a demon or does nothing. I did not care about what he likes after the first time we were together. I did not kiss him, blow him, or do anything else. I let him have me. He pummeled me. There was not a bit of making love in what we did. And you got off on it. I accused. Judy nodded. Yes, it was hot. I was like an addict. Judy admitted tearfully. I loved you. I still do. Our sex is great. But something about Mark doing me like that got to me. Somehow with him, I could disassociate myself from reality and enter some make-believe world where I could let Mark use me. I often hurt and was sore when he was finished. It was not something I could do with someone I loved and who loved me. Who you loved? I asked. Remember that evening when you were sitting on the sofa and got a text about you looked fine and how Mark wanted to drill me? Judy nodded. You covered neatly. I thought it was a mistake. That should have been a wake-up call. You came close to being caught. If you had stopped seeing him, I might have never known. I might have been the oblivious cuck Mark said I was. She bristled and said she hates that word. But you like the idea. You loved cheating on me because you kept doing it despite the risk. You deliberately kept cheating until I caught you. She shook her head in denial. Well, I hope you have fun with him. I said, quietly. Get dressed and leave. Our time is up. She looked shocked I would send her away so abruptly. Can't you claim me? Make me yours again, she asked plaintively. Bend me over and do me hard until I cry and beg you to stop? Just please don't send me away, she begged. I bent down and picked up her discarded pants and handed them to her. There is nothing to reclaim. You gave yourself to the a-hole, I said simply. Without another word she slipped her pants on, picked up her shoes and purse and walked outside. She stood for a moment, then taking her time, put on her shoes. I could tell she was hoping I would call her back. I'm so sorry, Robert. She said before she got into her car and drove away. I turned off the cell phone and laptop recordings and made a copy of each. Then sent the files to the cloud for safekeeping. I pulled a card out of my wallet. When the call was answered, I said, Sergeant Bergeron, this is Robert LeBlanc, the guy who got thrown down the stairs last week. I have a video you might find very interesting. While I was making copies of the video, my phone alerted me Judy was making a phone call. I was busy and did not listen at the time. The call was automatically recorded. I'm just driving home from meeting with Robert. Judy said, There is nothing wrong with his memory. He remembers every detail of what happened. Even details I had forgot. I'm glad you did not go with me like you wanted. I'm sure he would have shot you on the spot. He is not taking chances. It was not a good idea for me to even think about recording the conversation either. I'm glad I didn't try like you wanted. He called me on it right away. I stripped naked to show him I did not have a bug planted on me. I could not believe it. I sat there stark naked and other than looking me over a few times, he ignored my body. He is that pissed. I even begged him to take me to bed and reclaim me. What a fool. Mark scoffed. He is a full cock. Not even willing to try to reclaim his wife. Too much a chicken for even a revenge sex. The good thing is he has no actual proof we are screwing. His claims aren't worth shit. We're screwing, corrected Judy. Yeah, we're. We are gonna have to cool it for now. I'm sure my wife has somebody following me. She needs proof to clean me out in a divorce. The kids are damn near grown, but she gets 70% of everything we have, even the business. Plus support. Her father made us get the prenup before he'd finance us going into business. This might be the end of our marriage anyway, just based on what the cuck told her. But I could get by with a 50-50 split and no alimony. I'd have to give her the house, but I'd at least keep the brokerage. I could still earn a living. You know, I don't make enough to support myself if Robert divorces me, Judy said, even with some alimony. I just hope he gets over it. I'm willing to do anything to keep him. Counseling, wear a chastity belt, post-nuptial agreement, whatever it takes. Why? Screw the cuck. Mark scoffed. I'll send some sales your way to keep you afloat. We'd have to keep it quiet though so we don't piss off the other agents. You'll just have to give up that sex like you have been doing. Maybe throw in that sex every now and then for a little extra but not now. Not until I am in the clear with Julie. The first thing to worry about is I gotta get out from under this assault charge. What did the cuck say about taking the money to say he tripped? He said no way. He might go for a hundred K, but he'd need to see the transfer including routing number and all first. He believes you're lying about the account 
and says you wouldn't pay off anyway. Judy said, well, he's probably right there. If he was stupid enough to go contradict his statement and came to me with his hand out, I might spit in it. Mark laughed. I might get the cash and give him 25 up front. I'd record it though. Then accuse him of blackmailing me if he asked for more. A hundred? Screw that. I could have him killed for a whole lot less. If you say anything like that again, I'll confess to the cops myself. Judy said. And just in case you have those same ideas about getting rid of me, I'm going to make a video confession and give it to a few people for safekeeping. I'll tell you right now if Robert so much as gets dizzy and falls off his dock on his own and drowns, I'm going to turn you in. You will not threaten him again. Hey. Mark backpedaled quickly. I was just spouting off. I'd never do something like that. I don't think Judy was gullible enough to believe him. I was going to be on my toes. I made a recording of that conversation as well. I had an appointment with Bergeron later. He came out to the camp since it was not far out of town. I began to wonder if maybe Mark really did have a secret account. But why in the world would he tell anybody? Maybe he just opened his mouth and revealed it to Judy without thinking like he did about having me killed. Bergeron was impressed with the video of my conversation with Judy. I could see he was impressed with her body, although he did not comment about that. He would take it to the associate district attorney who was working the case. This is icing on the cake. We got back the initial forensic results. You had spatters of semen on your pants and a smear of semen and vaginal secretion on your right leg. We'll have to compare that with their DNA before the trial, of course. But who else would it be? We also checked out the sofa and the carpet where you said they had sex. Sure enough, matching spatters. Even a few towards the door. I guess as you two scuffled he dripped a bit, and as he struggled with you, it spread. The good thing is it shows you got into it with him a full twelve feet from the door. That plus the three feet from there to the top of the stairs further supports your story. I'm sure we will be upgrading the charges against him to attempted murder. Your wife might get charged as well. I'm not sure if they will call her just complicit or an active participant. That is up to the DA. Your skin and blood were under her fingernails, so she definitely grabbed you. Her statement she was trying to keep you from pulling your pistol could be used either way by a good attorney. I asked him how. If I was being attacked, I had the right to defend myself. Sometimes a good lawyer makes a situation sound different than it really was. For example, while Danvers grabbed you, he was not beating on you. He is a big man who likely would have beat you to a pulp, but had no weapon. You could not know he might throw you down the stairs. His saying he was going to kill you would make you think your life was in danger. Of course, he is going to deny he said anything like that. It comes down to the jury in those cases. But since you didn't shoot him, that part does not matter. I'm sure he cannot say he was afraid for his life because you had a gun and threw you down the stairs to defend himself. But don't be surprised if his lawyer tries something like that. I've seen some wild shit attempted to cast doubt. I got a call from my father-in-law that evening. He had heard I had been hurt but had been released from the hospital. He apologized for not coming to the hospital while I was there. He and my mother-in-law had been on a cruise for the past 10 days. Their flight back had just arrived. They were now on the road returning home. We have not been able to get through to Judy. We had three messages when we turned our phones back on. The first saying you had fallen down the stairs and you might die. One later saying you would be okay. And the last one saying you had been discharged from the hospital. You are doing okay, right? Bill, I hate you to hear it this way, but those messages do not tell you the whole story. I said, I like the man. Both he and his wife had been good to me. I did not fall down the stairs. I was pushed, virtually thrown. Judy's boss tried to kill me. I caught them having sex in my living room. It is going to be a mess. To say he was shocked would be an understatement. I heard him relate what I'd said to Sandy, my mother-in-law. I could hear her wail. Look, you need to have a talk with Judy and hear her side. Needless to say, I am not at home. A few moments later we hung up. I needed to get the ball rolling. I called my attorney first thing the next morning to check on the status of the divorce paperwork. The papers were ready to serve Judy. He only needed to know where she was. The process server had called the real estate office and checked my apartment and Judy was at neither place. Bergeron called to say they had arrested both Mark and Judy as soon as they got to work this morning. He had taken the audio and video files I provided to the associate district attorney the night before. The DA had apparently stayed late and got all the charges filed. The assistant DA wanted to see me in his office. I wondered why. Bergeron went with me. It turned out he wanted to caution me about my talking about the bribe to change my story. He said it could be construed I was willing if the price was right. 
I assured him Danvers did not have near enough money to buy me off or get me to settle. I wanted the bank information so I could pass it along to Julie Danvers. I told him I had already called Julie to tell her about the alleged secret account and she was going to have her lawyer look into it. That satisfied him, but he still had me write a statement to that effect. Look, best to leave the investigating to others. You don't want to get into trouble. We can't use the audio recordings. We can't even use illegally obtained information to further an investigation. It is called fruit of the poisonous tree. But you got a lot of good stuff on video and that is legal because you are in it. Mark Danvers was charged with attempted murder. Judy was charged as an accomplice after the act. The DA did not think they could get charges of assault to stick in her case, but he did not want to let her get away scot-free either. With accomplice after the fact charges, she could get no more than a $500 fine and up five years in jail. I thought that was ludicrous. 500 versus five years. Bergeron laughed and said the law is screwy sometimes. Danvers would likely go down. The DA suggested he be lenient on Judy if she testified against Mark. That seemed like all the satisfaction I'd get. At least Judy would not get off completely. I really hated to see her get burned too bad. No matter how much I hated what she had done to me. I called my lawyer to tell him where she was. She would be served when she got released. My brother John went with me to get the rest of my clothes out of the apartment. My clothes, my desktop computer, and a few pistols I had locked in the safe was about all I wanted out of the house. I looked around. Everything else would remind me too much of Judy and the life we had built together, as short as it was. We were almost finished packing the last bit when Sandy, Judy's mother, drove up. We were stacking the boxes on the landing. Crying, she grabbed me in a big hug. I cannot believe my daughter would throw away what she had for a little sex with somebody else. She bemoaned tearfully. Do you think there is any way possible you could work through this? Before I could react, she continued. I'm not talking forgive her. Especially not right away. I mean after a lot of counseling. Just before Bill and I left on our cruise, Judy had said you guys were going to start working on getting her pregnant. We were so looking forward to that. I looked over at Rachel, Judy's 22-year-old sister. She had come with her mother to get some of Judy's things. She was shaking her head. I can't tell you how much this tears me up. I confessed. I have video and audio that shows just how bad it was. Judy has no idea I have any of this. Both her and her boyfriend think it is my word against theirs. You have proof. Sandy asked, surprised. Judy made it sound like the affair was just a little fling. She regretted it, of course, but you were totally unforgiving. This was not a little fling. It went on for months. No. What I have is damning. I said. Some of it is pretty bad. Nudity. Bad language. The works. I don't think you should see it. Screw that, Robert. Sandy said, vehemently. I'm a big girl. You always were polite. You stifled cursing in front of Bill and me. I probably use worse language than you do. And I know what a naked person having sex looks like. So does Bill. I want to see and hear whatever you have. All of it. I am guessing from the way you are acting, the files will show my daughter a complete 304. It's bad, isn't it? I nodded. I started out not wanting Judy to be able to claim I was a playing jackass who could not forgive a little indiscretion. That went south quick. It is bad. I really do not want to hurt you. I said. I told you. I want to see what you have. Sandy declared. Cheating pisses me off. I don't care if it was you who did it or Judy. I had plenty of chances to screw around on Bill over the years. Some of the offers might have rocked my boat. I'm sure. I never did. I agreed to give her the audio portion of my meeting with Judy and the other audio files. Judy is going to need your support. I said. She is in for a rough legal battle. Sandy nodded. We'll support her, but that does not mean we'll condone what she did. Sandy said. I told them I was moving out and Judy could stay, but Sandy said Judy would live with them for the time being. At Rachel's insistence, she went to pack some of Judy's clothes. Damn. This is some shit. Rachel offered. I agreed. No. You know only part of it. I was 17 when you and Judy got together. I was dating a guy on the football team, not having sex, just going out. Mom made a big issue how Judy hit the mother load. She found a great guy who would stick by her forever. Somebody like Dad. You weren't big and handsome, but decent looking and sexy in your own way. Somebody a girl could count on to love her. Smart and loyal. I laughed. You are making me sound like a border collie. A hole. Rachel said, grinning. You know what I mean. I got to know you. I envied my sister. I dated guys and looked for somebody like she had. Never found one. Rachel grabbed me in an embrace. 
I'm just gonna say it. If my sister is so dumb, she'd give you up. I want you. I've loved you for a long time. I just want you to know. I'm here. I really did not know how to react. I knew none of this was good. I hugged Rachel and told her I appreciated her love. She smiled and planted a lip lock on me that gave me a hard on. All three of the women in Judy's family had that effect on me. I told Rachel that Judy did not really have to move out of the apartment. I would be living at my family's fish camp outside of town. Rachel shook her head. Mom is pissed Judy screwed up a good thing. She wants her back at home where she can tell her how she messed up. And I think to keep an eye on her. I offered Judy could live with me if she had to and Mom shut that down. Rachel said, I am just graduating and Mom does not want me saddled with Judy. Mom says I need to seek my own life and live with the decisions I make. On the way over she repeated that same thing a hundred times. John began to carry my things to the car. The doctor had cautioned me about strenuous activity, so John was doing all the heavy work. My cast did not help either. I have your phone number. I know where your fish camp is. Get ready for me. Rachel said with a grin. She leaned forward and whispered she hoped I might be ready for some exertion soon. Hey, guy. I heard from behind me. It was Cheryl, the woman from across the landing. I see you are up and at M. Then she looked at the boxes on the landing. I hope you aren't trying to carry any of those. You know you are not supposed to do any lifting. You suffered a pretty good concussion. You don't need to aggravate that. How did you know how bad I was hurt and what my doctor's orders were? I asked. I do want to thank you for helping me out when I got hurt. I heard you were right there, checking me out. Cheryl pulled at name tag on her scrub top. I work in critical care in the hallway right around the corner from where you were. I do mainly cardiac instead of neuro. Greta, the nurse taking care of you most of the time was my roommate in nursing school. I kept tabs on you. I said the doctor said I only had a little swelling. Yeah, that's like saying you had a little heart attack or are a little pregnant. Cheryl laughed. I looked at your chart and we nurses share information on the unit. You had a significant injury. You need to take it easy. Just because they say 7 to 10 days, my advice is to make that a minimum. I knew she was a nurse but not the details. Judy and I had invited her over a few times. She had shared snippets of her personal life. I liked her. I told her my brother was doing all the carrying and loading. I only packed my clothes. I thanked her again for saving my life. She snorted. I was scared shitless, to be truthful. I don't do neuro but I was trained. I was afraid you had broken your neck. Cervical breaks can stop respiration. If you quit breathing, I'd have a hell of a time doing CPR in the position you were in. I just loosened your tie and pulled the top of your shirt open and checked your eyes. Upside down like that wasn't helping your cranial pressure, but I could not do a thing to help that. I had nothing to stabilize your neck, so moving you was out of the question. I was glad you didn't start to wake up and move around. But the ambulance arrived pretty quick. Do you still have the video you took? I asked. She said her mother had taken all the pictures and video, but she had copies. She asked for my phone number so she could forward it all. I watched the video. Rachel looked at it as well. Well, there is no doubt what they were doing. Judy is going to piss her panties when I tell her about seeing her fresh drilled look. Rachel giggled. Cheryl said, I'm guessing you are Judy's sister. You look like her. We stood there for a minute. Then Cheryl gave me a hug whispering in my ear. You have my number now. Call me when you want to talk to somebody. Out loud she said, Take care of yourself, Robert. Do everything slow and easy. No exertion. She turned and went to her apartment. I was not sure if she put a little extra wiggle into her step or if it was just my imagination. John was amused as we drove away. Your mother-in-law would jump your bones in a heartbeat if she was single. She is one classy lady. But she loves her husband and won't cheat. I looked over at him. Judy's sister wants you too. Now she'd jump into your bed quick. All you gotta do is let her. I shook my head. Plus that neighbor, the nurse. She wants you too. You think I wasn't listening? Yeah, kinda screwed up. But you have options, little brother. He laughed halfway to the fish camp. I wanted the divorce to be as easy as possible. I wanted to get it done quickly. I had my lawyer offer Judy I would pay half her rent and utilities if she stayed in the apartment alone. I'd even pay half her grocery bill as long as it was food bought for her alone and not takeout or at a restaurant. I'd even keep her on my cell phone plan. I offered this support for two years, saying she could use that time to get on her feet. Judy's lawyer quickly computed this was far more in her favor than the percentage of my income the law specified. I knew he told her how restrictive it would be, but she accepted my terms and signed. Of course, Judy had bigger things to worry about than our impending divorce. 
She had been accused of being an accomplice after the fact for helping Mark attempt murder. She got released on her own recognizance. She had not been not charged the first time, only questioned. Mark Danvers did not fare so well. The charge of attempted murder called for another bail to be set and a percentage paid. Mark only had a little cash available. Julie had taken her 70% of their cash and sealed their investment accounts. He could not touch any of that money. He did not have the 10000 to pay the bondsman fee. His lawyer was trying to get him a signature loan. Apparently having the community assets locked in a divorce made it difficult to use as collateral. I laughed, imagining him stewing in a jail cell. Mark considered himself a mover and a shaker. Now he was being moved and shaken. Julie was as vindictive as me. I had told her about the alleged secret account in the Caribbean under her son's name. She said she would check it out. To my surprise, the secret account really did exist. Julie's lawyer confirmed it, so he, Julie, and her son flew down to get the money. Her son was not on the signature card, but because it was in his name, he could transfer the funds. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall when Mark found out his hidden money was gone. Because it was in his son's name, it was not part of the community property. To make things worse for poor Mark, he would soon be facing problems with the IRS. He did not follow proper procedure for gifting minors. However it worked out and whoever paid the taxes, Mark would never get a penny. I loved it. Julie told me later her son split the money evenly with his two siblings, funding their college funds as well. The Danvers boys were honest, at least with each other. Justice is slow. My divorce with Judy was over months before her criminal trial. Her trial was linked with Mark's. She was accused of helping him hide his part in my attack. Julie had seen to it his resources were limited. He still had his 30% of their community assets, but that was not much. His real estate agents were ready to quit on him because of his ruined reputation. Julie got Mark to agree to sign off and sell the franchise. She could have forced the issue, but him signing expedited things. As part of that agreement, he gave up the right to start another brokerage within 50 miles for five years. I loved it. He needed the money for his defense, so he agreed. While we waited for the criminal trial, I propositioned Julie for a little roll in the hay. Her initial response was to call me a sick mother F. Then a few seconds later she grinned and said, You really want to stick it to them, don't ya? We laughed about staging a fake video, but then she said if she did anything at all she'd go for the whole enchilada. In the end, we decided against it. The week before he would get the money to make bail, she went to visit him. I went with her. We talked through a plexiglass window. He asked why I was there and Julie said because I deserved to be. She winked at Mark and grinned. I held my index and middle finger over my mouth and flicked my tongue. Then subtly, I pushed my index finger through the circle made by my other index finger and thumb. Mark glared and turned red. He paused a few seconds before he reacted. I thought he'd get angry, but I was astonished by his actions. He went ape hit. I found out later there are many rules when in lockup. One of the main ones was about losing one's temper. Mark picked up his chair and swung it repeatedly against the plexiglass window. He was immediately, and I'm sure painfully subdued. I heard later he was put into segregation for re weeks. His bail got delayed. It was almost denied altogether because he now posed a threat to both Julie and me. He really should learn to control his mouth. At his trial, he spent half his time glaring at me rather than following the testimony. He should never have got on the stand. Not after I claimed he wanted to kill me having called me a cuck repeatedly. When asked if he threatened to kill me, he said, I don't remember saying it at first, but right now I'd make sure of it. Then he began to rant. He called me a lying chicken, a cuck, and a few other things that cast aspersions on my father's identity and my mother's species. I have to admit I had deliberately antagonized the man a bit. Careful to not be seen, I had just repeated the gestures of pushing one index finger into a circle of the other index finger and thumb. I had held my index and middle finger in a V and flicked my tongue between just a few seconds before. I did it subtly so nobody else noticed. The man was now livid despite being carefully reserved a few minutes before. His lawyer looked stricken. The forensics bore out the fact he had indeed attacked me and moved me some 15 feet to the top of the stairs where he threw me to my death now saying he would kill me if he could did not help his case. Mark's lawyer was fairly good. The lawyer tried to convince the jury Mark was justifiably upset as his only real crime was having sex with a married woman and defending himself from an angry husband with a gun. Mark had lost his career, his marriage, and his freedom. He had been beaten a few times in jail. His present state of mind was influenced by PTSD, so his actions should be forgiven. 
The lawyer managed to cast enough doubt Mark only got sentenced to 10 years in jail rather than a possible 15 even after he got angry at me in court. Judy was called back to the stand to repeat her testimony. She never heard Mark threaten to kill me in the apartment, but on cross by the DA, she admitted he had said he might hire somebody to kill me. She was very upset at Mark's violent rant in the courtroom. She had said earlier that it was Mark who had originally concocted the story how he was merely visiting her, and I overreacted then ran when Mark stood up to confront me. She admitted the fall was not accidental but a very deliberate action on Mark's part. At her own trial she repeated that testimony saying she was terrified at the time and thinking I was dead, she agreed to support Mark's lies. She was sentenced to a year in the parish jail that the DA suggested be suspended. The judge disagreed and wanted her to serve three months at least considering her original false statement to the police. Judy came to see me when she got out. She wanted to apologize for cheating on me. We had not talked in private since the day we talked at the fish camp. I also want to thank you for not spreading the video you took when we talked. It was bad enough you gave mom the audio portion. I was a 304 to strip and beg like that, but I wanted to be your 304. Mom gave me a little crap about that. But she really read me the riot act for cheating on you and destroying our marriage. It was bad enough just knowing what I did, but she saw the video Cheryl's mom took. She told me if you weren't such a gentleman, you'd have let everybody see me naked and freshly screwed, disgracing the whole family. As I knew she would, she asked, is there any way we can get back together? I was hoping with counseling or a postnup. Well, it would be a prenup now. I shook my head saying a prenup did not stop Mark. I'm not Mark. I got stupid. I should have talked to you. Can we stay friends? I mean, we'll need to if you date my sister. Rachel told me she wants to get with you someday. I told her I had written that off as well. Judy left after wishing me well and saying she hopes I will forgive her someday. While I liked Rachel and the whole family, there was no way it would work. It would only cause friction in the family sooner or later, and while I was still hurt at her disrespect, I did not want her family damaged. I wonder how Mark is dealing with life in jail. I laughed at that thought. I bet he got into a fight or two. I'm trying to find out how he is doing. Julie says she is going to go visit with her boys. Two are under 18, so she has to go along. She wants to ask him if he is giving BJs to fellow inmates, when the boys can't hear. I did hear about Mark a few months later. He got moved to a new unit after being in segregation. I had no idea what he did, but they apparently did not take kindly to his attitude. He was found unconscious in a corner of the shower room. He had obviously been kicked repeatedly in the groin. He had most of his toiletries pushed up his rectum. A full bar of soap went first followed by his toothbrush and tube of toothpaste. Once those items had been removed it became apparent he had been sodomized first. I sent him a smiley face greeting card. If you think I paid someone to do it. Well, you are absolutely right. Throughout my court hearings I did make some friends, who had friends in the jail administration, who had friends behind the bars, who really needed cigarette money. Although she called me several times trying to get me to change my mind, I never did date Rachel, Judy's sister. She argued her parents thought it would not be a problem and Judy was on board with us getting together. But I knew it would eventually cause friction. I broke off all contact although I did see one of them around town on occasion. Judy moved to Shreveport and got a job as a sales rep for a small manufacturing company. I imagine a woman as hot as her had an active sex life. I also had an active sex life with an accounts administrator. Cheryl and I dated and then she moved in with me. A year later we got married and immediately decided to have a baby. Good communication is a big issue with us and she shares my thoughts of fidelity. I know someday I'm going to have to be careful when Mark gets out of prison. I have hope he gets shift. Maybe I need to spend some more cigarette money. Okay, I'm still a bit of a prick, but only to those who try to hurt me. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.